Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Turn the Page, the podcast of Syosset Library. This is Barney Leventino, and today I'm happy to welcome uh, Dr. William Maz. William, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, your newest book is The Bucharest Legacy, and it is actually the second of your books in this series. The first book was The Bucharest Dossier. Um, Tell us a little bit about both briefly, and then we'll get into the nuts and bolts. And I'll tell you um, before we go into it that I had gotten um, from your publicist, the Bucharest Legacy, and I'm the kind of guy, I don't really like to jump into a series midstream. And right. particularly when I see there's really one or two books ahead, before I speak to the author, I always like to go back to the beginning. And, and I took the uh, the time to do that. In fact, I read both books uh, pretty much back to back. So I was really immersed in 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 uh, Bill Heflin and and uh, uh, the intrigue that were going on in Bucharest. So let's talk a little bit about. Let's start with the Bucharest dossier, and then we'll get into the newest. Okay. Well, they are both Cold War spy thrillers as a genre, which there aren't many left anymore. Uh, even Jean Le Carré gave up on it at some point, thinking the Cold War is over. And my premise has always been that the Cold War never ended. Mm -hmm. It just took a hiatus. And now some people are saying it's back. No, it never went away. And so the Bucharest dossier takes place um, in Bucharest, Romania in 1989, December, uh, where uh, there was a revolution and the communist system was uh, overturned. Nicolae Ceausescu, the Stalinist leader, was um, executed along with his wife. And that forms the background, the historic background, of which, by the way, I did a lot of research, and it is um, accurate to the best of my ability. Uh, <clears throat> the, the first book as I state in the author's note, is um, is technically created as a love story inside of a spy thriller, inside of a historical novel. It started out as a love story, and it eventually ended up as a spy thriller. <laughs> um, the uh, revolution in Romania was unique in several ways. One of them was that it was the last country in the Eastern European communist states to shed communism. Secondly, because by December of 89, the wall had fallen, the Berlin Wall had fallen, and all the other countries had had so-called velvet revolutions where there weren't any shots fired, and they did away with communism. The only one left was Romania, and it did not have a peaceful revolution. In I, fact, I'm going to ask you about that. I'm going to interrupt yeah. one second, because it's um, it's suggested in the book that um, the Russians really were kind of looking to guide it towards more of a softer, if you would, revolution than yeah. actually what took place. And um, your book um, talks about uh, outside influences, and I don't want to give too much of the plot line away, um, that might have steered it towards the really, really the bloody uh, result that came about. So how much of that was accurate or how much of that was was a little bit of, of, of gilding the lily, so to speak? Well, there was a little bit of both. Uh, <clears throat> the accurate part was that the Russians, Gorbachev particularly, wanted Romania to remain in its sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they had planned for a coup since 1985 with a general named Militaru which is kind of an interesting name for a military man to have a last name of Militaru. But, um, <clears throat> and the reason is Gorbachev hated Ceausescu uh, and Ceausescu hated Gorbachev. 
Gorbachev wanted glasnost and perestroika, wanted an easing of the socialist system. Ceausescu was a uh, hardline Stalinist. And in fact, publicly, Ceausescu dressed down Gorbachev mm -hmm. uh, when they last met, and then Gorbachev was furious. Everybody knew that Gorbachev wanted Ceausescu out. The question is, did he need a bloody revolution to do that? Okay. At that time, Bucharest, which is fact, was a wild west of espionage because both sides wanted Romania right. to come towards them. Now, uh, Iliescu, which is the guy who took over after Ceausescu and the guy who Gorbachev wanted to take over after Ceausescu, had been a classmate of Gorbachev in Moscow. They knew each other 20 years before, whenever it was. <clears throat> so it is not an, an accident that he became the president. In fact, he appeared out of nowhere. Uh, Iliescu had been a uh, close confidant of Ceausescu, and then he was pushed away by him because he was pushing the idea of Gorbachev, which is to relax a little bit the system. <clears throat> so Iliescu was known among the communists, but he wasn't part of the revolution outwardly. Behind the scenes, he was. So that part is history. Mm -hmm. And the, and in fact, uh, Militaro and Iliescu were planning a coup in January of 1990, but then they said the revolution came before that. Right. That part we know. The part we don't know is who was behind the revolution. Right. There are many things that are true that I write in the book. First of all, there were snipers from the Middle East in, in the town called Timisoara, where the revolution started. The snipers shot at both the military and the people. That got the military confused. They started shooting indiscriminately. And that's how the massacre in Timisoara began. There were also Stankulescu, General Stankulescu, thought to have been, not proven, a CIA asset since 1985 or 86, I don't remember, because Stankulescu was the uh, <clears throat> defense minister or deputy defense minister until the defense minister was shot. They say he committed suicide, but... Uh, most people think he was shot by Ceausescu for refusing to fire on the people. He was he became defense minister and immediately entrapped uh, Ceausescu uh, into getting on the helicopter to escape and then brought him down. He set up the <clears throat> he set up the kangaroo court and then the immediate execution after it, about less than an hour of court time. Now, if you put all that together, what does it tell you? I don't know for a fact that the CIA was involved, but you got Stankulescu there. Mm -hmm. You got a bloody revolution. Gorbachev didn't need a bloody revolution. He could have done a coup d'etat very nicely. In fact, the bloody revolution was bad for him right. because then nobody wanted communism anymore. So that is the basis of my thinking. We'll never know until the archives of the Securitate, the Secret Service there, are opened, which may not be for a long time, and we can go into why not. But, you know, I, I, I don't want to give our listeners um, the idea that, that this is a, um, a dry political no. uh, uh, recitation of what went on. What it really is, is um, an interesting, on several levels, uh, Cold War spy thriller interspersed with a love story, interspersed with the factual uh, events that were going on. So it is on on its own, even even setting aside um, the factual content and and the historical research. It's a fun fun read as a thriller, just on that level. So I don't want to give the readers the wrong idea that this is a dry history book. Well, it's actually it's an exciting thriller. Yeah. Let me tell you how the book starts a little bit, so I can give the people some idea. Yeah. So we have uh, Bill Heflin, who is a uh, Romanian-born American, came here early. And he is a CIA analyst for Eastern Europe, especially Romania, where he was born. 
And he is unique among analysts because he has his own mole inside the KGB. Analysts don't usually have that. It's field agents who do. And how did he get this mole? Out of nowhere. The mole started sending him intelligence. And he codenamed the mole Boris. Now, Boris, in December of 89, sends him a message to tell him that he wants to Heflin to come to Bucharest to, quote, create history. Heflin has another reason for wanting to go back to Bucharest, and that is a little girl that he was in love with when he was six years old named Pusha, who has taken on mythical proportions in his mind, the ideal of love. He's always been afraid to go back. But now that he is, he's looking forward to finding her and seeing what has happened to her. So that's the love story. When he goes to Bucharest, he realizes that Boris is more than simply his asset. Mm -hmm. Boris knows everything about him, about his life, about his parents, about everything. And so we begin to understand that Boris is a bit of a puppeteer not only in Heflin's life but in the revolution itself and in his love story so it gets complicated all three threads eventually get tied up by the end and so it is it is at the same time that it's a spy story it is also a quest for love and for the enduring love of a six-year-old that has lasted 20 years there there's um a number of things about Bill Heflin that um, kind of coincide a little bit with your life, um, if, if if I'm seeing things correctly. Uh, both came to the United States from Romania as children. Uh, both are Harvard graduates. Uh, you went on to medical school. He went into the CIA. But but how much of of, of Bill's life is, uh, is is reflected in your own life? Well, this goes back to what they always tell you in writing classes. Write what you know. The mistake most writers make at the beginning is to write things exactly the way it happened and then think it's a story. And when they get criticism, they said, but this is exactly how it was. Mm -hmm. And the answer is you're not supposed to write how it was because life doesn't give it to you in the form of a story. A story has a Mm -hmm. format. And so I use parts of my life to begin stories, to include stories, but they're not anything uh, other than marks from where to begin writing fiction. So I did go to Harvard. I was not approached by the CIA, although other people were Mm -hmm. in the men's clubs that I talked about. Yale had the same thing. Right. Um, uh, I, in during the 80s, when I was living in America, I came here when I was eight years old. Uh, I went I started going back to Bucharest to visit uh, relatives and friends. So I probably was there a dozen times during the summers. And I saw exactly how the communist regime worked, the fear that everybody had of the Securitate. They had microphones everywhere. All telephones became bugged, were bugged with microphones from the factory. There were lines for food. There was people stood in lines not knowing what they were buying because they had gone to a border system. Whatever they bought, they could exchange among themselves. A lot of scenes happened exactly how they were in the book. For instance, talking to a famous actor who wanted to know if the play Tribute was written exactly for Jack Lemon, And I lied to him. I said yes, because I could see that that's what he wanted to hear. Yeah. That's a real actor. There. His name is Rado Beligan. He was a, he's like the Laurence Olivier of uh, Romania. And uh, he was in a play with my cousin, Irina, there that I use also in the book. So, okay. but of course... Everything else about it is false. Nothing that happened to Irina in the book uh, actually occurred in life. But that's how what you do. You know, you you steal from real life and then you you do what you need to do to make the book. The um, the characters in, in, in the story, the, the, the recurring characters, even, even the villain in the Bucharest legacy. We haven't even talked about that yet, but um I sense in all of them, in in Bill Heflin, in um, Catherine, 
yeah. in in, um, in Boris, there's almost a a lack of real grounding um, in these people. They're they're all Bill is 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 misplaced, displaced several times in his life. Catherine also has some mysterious elements of her past. Um, Boris is is something of a chameleon, um, literally. I mean, a lifetime spy, and nobody even knows, you know, what his real name might be. Um, right. But I, I get this sense that the the for these characters that they're missing the the anchor to their to their roots is is a key element in their in their characters and in their development and the way that they go about living their lives. Well, like Catherine says, they are citizens of the world traveling light. You know, there are no roots for these people. Um, And in in many ways, it reflects my own sense of rootlessness. You know, uh, my grandparents went to Romania from Greece. So they were the first immigrants. Then my parents grew up in Romania, and then they left to Greece, and then we finally came to the United States. So we are professional immigrants. Mm-hmm. And that is one reason why I I tie it to the uh, Roma, the gypsy uh, people in Romania, because they are professional immigrants also, never accepted anywhere, never feeling at home anywhere. Now, America is is probably the only place where I could feel at home, because to some degree or other, everybody's an immigrant. Yeah, we're all from somewhere else. <laughs> we're all from somewhere else. But um, not in Europe. In Europe, they have thousands of years of history, you know, and they remember. Uh, in Romania, they don't like Greeks because, because why? The Turks, when they were under the Turkish Empire, used Greeks from Constantinople called Fariots to, to, uh, um, uh, oversee Romania and to govern Romania because they didn't want the Romanians to govern themselves because of fear of revolution. So the Romanians hate the Greeks for that. That's hundreds of years ago. Right. They have very long <laughs> memories. <remember>. Yes. <laughs> so, yes, ruthlessness is a major theme in this book. You touched upon, and I, I had made a note to myself about <laughs> it, the, um, the plight of and the treatment of the Roma people. Yes. In, in the country. Um, talk a little bit about that and, and, and whether things are changing for them or how things are changing. Yes, they're getting worse. Uh, <laughs> I think if that's possible. Um, the Roma uh, uh, gypsy comes from the Greek word Egyptos, which means Egyptian. Now, the Roma are not Egyptian, but in the Middle Ages, they thought they were. So that's how they got the name. The Roma actually are Indian, from India, northern India. And over the centuries, they've been migrating all throughout Europe, and there are a lot of them in the United States also. Nobody knows how many, because a lot of them don't admit that they are Roma, and uh, because they want to blend in. But they are, they have been always um, treated badly. And if, if, you know, if there's a plague, it's their fault. <laughs> if, if there's a hurricane, it's their fault. Um, they are not uh, educated, uh, the same way as everybody else in Romania. They don't, uh, they're not allowed to fit in if they know that they are, uh, uh, gypsies. And so, um, they were put in a district called the Ferentari district, which I mentioned in the second book. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is a slum, basically, that nobody even collects the garbage. Um, it is just a, uh, and during communism, at least they were, they had a, a system of trying to feed them, to try to educate them, to try to integrate them. After communism, and we can talk about that, there was a huge economic slump uh, in Romania, huge unemployment, like 40, 45%. And so uh, the gypsies were basically forgotten about and uh, allowed to stay on their own. And they're, they have no, no floor, so to speak, no, uh, nothing to catch them. The government is no longer uh, involved as much as they used to be. So the, they are in a bad shape. Well, I was 
hoping for a different answer, quite frankly. Yeah. I was hoping that maybe things were getting better, but that's just not a good situation. It's horrible. And it, unfortunately, no, every society seems to find the scapegoat. Yeah. And, and in Romania, it seems that it's the Roma. It's the Roma. It used to be the Roma and the gypsies and the Greeks. Uh, I mean, the, the, I'm sorry, the Roma and the Jews and the Greeks, uh, but there weren't that many Jews left and there weren't that many Greeks left because many of them left. So, uh, it's the Roma now, the gypsies. The, um, the first book focuses on the December 89 revolution, the transition from, from hardline communism to what everybody was thinking might be almost a democratic regime. Um, right. We see in the Bucharest legacy that it didn't necessarily turn out exactly the way uh, people anticipated. Talk a little bit about um, what's going on in book two, how Bill finds himself back in Bucharest again and, and where that's going. So by the end of book one, without giving away everything, um, most of those uh, uh, hanging plot lines have been resolved. Um, uh, Bill Heflin is returned back into the CIA uh, because they want him to take a, a defector out of Bucharest. So the first scene is exfiltrating a defector, a KGB defector, uh, which doesn't go as well as he thinks it would be. It would go. and But then he eventually brings him back to Langley, to the CIA headquarters, and the defector has something very interesting to tell the CIA. He says, there is a mole among your midst. Mm-hmm. And the handler of the mole is known to your agency as Boris. Now, this is a shock to everybody because Boris has been the asset that Heflin has been handling all this time. And if that's the case, that means Boris was a triple agent giving everybody false information and actually handling a mole inside the CIA. And if that's the case, then the obvious person is Heflin himself. Now, his uh, chief of operations doesn't believe that so he gives Heflin a chance to prove himself and he sends him back to Bucharest to find Boris and clear his name but I can tell you because I tell you at the beginning of the second book something that Heflin is the only one that knows the CIA and the KGB don't know which is that uh, Boris has been dead for a year over, over a year so everybody's looking for Boris when he's a dead man. And so when uh, Heflin returns to Bucharest, instead of uh, <clears throat> democracy, what he finds is a country that hasn't changed very much. I told you the un- you know, unemployment rate was up to 40, 45% immediately after the revolution. Why? Because during the communist days, the communists always bragged that everybody has a job, right? You can't not have a job. How did they do that? Well, they packed all their factories and their whatever companies with people uh, overstaffed. And nobody worked very hard. Uh, Half the time they, they left work in order to stand in line for food. The places were very inefficient. When communism fell... They had to privatize all of these state-owned companies. And once they were privatized, of course, they had to get rid of half their workforce to make them profitable. Mm -hmm. And it's during this privatization process that the oligarchs were created. And we can and we can go into how that happened. It's it happened not only in Romania, it happened in every other almost every other uh, former Eastern, former communist country, Eastern European country, the ones that didn't have it, like East Germany, it's because they immediately, East Germany immediately united with West Germany, and West Germans were the ones that took care of the privatization process. But in almost every other country, it was a corrupt process where all of these companies that had been owned by the government ended up in the hands of a few. 
And who were these few? Almost always they were former security service personnel. In Romania, it was the Securitate, it was called. In uh, Russia, it's KGB. In Bulgaria, whatever the name is, but it was the security services. I have papers and papers on all of these countries where they all ended up being security, former security people who ended up with these companies. How did that happen? Well, <clears throat> the it was a basically a symbiotic relationship between the government in charge during the privatization process and these security people. The security people had dossiers on everybody. Mm -hmm. In the Stasi dossiers, there were 111 kilometers of dossiers from floor to ceiling. There are millions of dossiers. Everything you did, especially if you were in any position of responsibility, was known, photographed, so forth. Everybody stole during the communist days. That was part of the course, the part for the course. If you were a government official, you stole from the budget. OK, and everybody asks, why is the Russian army so weak today? One of the reasons is that the military has been stealing the funds and creating yachts, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, villas in Monte Carlo. And <clears throat> so that's an old tradition in the communist system. Ceausescu knew that everybody was stealing. OK, but he allowed it because he was creating an oligarch system himself. Right. All these underlings were getting wealthy. They had offshore accounts. But he wanted that in order for them to have skin in the game to prop him up and keep the system going. We, we have to go back to what is an oligarch, because I think there's a little confusion there. The definition goes back to Aristotle, believe it or not. An oligarch is not simply a rich person. An oligarch is a person whose wealth depends on the king or the government. So we had oligarchs all throughout European history, but they weren't called that. They were called dukes and earls and barons. But what were they? They were oligarchs. Why? Because how did they get their wealth? The king gave them a piece of land they called Essex, and they say, okay, now you're the Earl of Essex, okay? And so the, the king did that because he needed them to prop him up, right. okay, to keep him in power. And so when the communists fell, the Securitate, the Secret Service, had dossiers on all these corrupt officials who remained in power. They're all bureaucrats, okay? It's only the leadership that fell. Right. These Securitate people with this information in their dossiers were able to blackmail all of these people in the bureaucratic system to pretty much rubber stamp anything that they wanted, including parliamentarians, judges, they all were corrupt during the communist days. And the president himself. Um, and so these companies ended up in the hands of the Securitate officials, and the rest is history, as they say. It's it's amazing that the essentially in almost the blink of an eye, you you swapped out one yeah. overtly corrupt system for another overtly corrupt system, which is still being managed essentially by the same people. It's just, it just, it, it nothing really changed except for the, the, the window dressing. 